in the eye, really looking into the patient and public health implications. As Dr. Foster mentioned, uh, I work with uh, four wonderful And certainly, uh, following the footsteps of giants in, in, uh, in the field of UBI's, Dr. Doug, Doug Jabs, Dr. Russell Van Gelder, and Dr. Janet Davis, uh, who have all done tremendous work in the field related to infectious disease in UBI's and how it affects our individual patients. Uh, first, before we get started, I would also like to acknowledge the, the wonderful work of Dr. Jessica Shanta, who is a friend and a dear friend and colleague to many of us. Uh, she trained at UCSF and is currently on faculty at Emory University, and really has taken a leadership role. Um, as a women's health scholar funded through the NIH, uh, doing, doing a really a lion's share of the work um, in a leadership role, uh, both in the United States and West Africa related to Ebola-related disease. Uh, I have to talk, thank, also thank Dr. Ian Crozier, who is both a patient and physician and part of our care team, as well as many, many other individuals, uh, many of whom are in this room, and we certainly appreciate that uh, for the advice that we've garnered um, over the last few years, as well as growing partnerships uh, from West Africa, including Dr. Lloyd Williams, who's here with us today from Sierra Leone, and Dr. Uh, Jalikatu uh, Mustafa from Sierra Leone as, as well. Again, many partnering organizations to support this work, both industry, NGO, and government. So the, the impact of emerging infectious disease is certainly global. Uh, we know about the United States uh, outbreak of measles within the past 10 months. Uh, Nipah virus is a dangerous virus that causes a central nervous system uh, effects with encephalitis, which was recently identified in the southern part of India, and <coughs> found in Southeast Asia. And there's currently an ongoing outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo of Ebola, which is, uh, has been considered a public health emergency of international concern. The economic impact is significant, ranging from anywhere $2 billion from the West African outbreak to $54 billion to the SARS outbreak in Asia in the early 2000s. And this is a significant impact for us as ophthalmologists because of the ophthalmic manifestations. I'll just start with Zika virus. We learned from Dr. Camila Ventura and her team from the Altina Ventura Foundation in Brazil that in the context of congenital Zika virus syndrome, infants who are born to Zika virus infected mothers can develop microcephaly in addition to macular atrophy, optic nerve hypoplasia, and anterior segment abnormalities. And we'll continue to learn about this disease condition. These patients in their acute phase can also develop an acute hypertensive anterior uveitis. Posterior segment manifestations have been reported by Dr. Gita Shen uh, from the NIH and others for Zika virus as well. The flavivirus, dengue, chikungunya, were also an outbreak of proportions as the Zika virus was going through South and Central America. And West Nile virus, we, we've learned about from the early outbreak in the 2000s in the United States. Dengue can cause a foveal inflammatory process, chikungunya can cause debilitating arthritis, as well as inflammatory manifestations of the optic nerve. And West Nile virus can cause a multifocal choroiditis, optic nerve inflammation, as well as retinal hemorrhage as well. So we've learned a lot about these diseases. And we also know from the lessons learned related to infectious diseases that many of these infectious conditions that we see more commonly in the United States, including syphilis and TB around the world, are on the rise of epidemic proportions or emerging proportions. Acute run necrosis ties into the story of persistent pathogens with these viruses that can cause destructive retinitis, which can be blinding as a subject of great clinical and research interest of our group. Uh, toxoplasmosis, we know, is a significant public health problem. Again, West Nile virus is mentioned, and Zika virus we're still learning about. But I'm going to be focusing on Ebola virus disease related to the implications <coughs> of what we've learned. So it really starts with an individual patient. Uh, 
this young girl, uh, her name was Aminata Kanta. Uh, this is all HIPAA compliant because she was actually uh, featured in the New York Times. And you can actually see that she has a dense white cataract due to her uveitis. And Denise Grady, the reporter who traveled with us, uh, was, was, was really drawn in by the story of Ebola's legacy for children who had developed cataracts after survivorship from Ebola. This is immediately relevant because there's actually three, there, there have been three Ebola outbreaks in the New York Congo, including the second largest Ebola outbreak in history, which is currently ongoing and has been considered a public health emergency of international concern with over 3,000 cases, over 2,000 deaths, about one third of these are children. And there's been tremendous security instability over a recent election last year, conflict with Eastern DRC with armed militia, making it very difficult to contain the outbreak, sharing forest borders with Uganda, Rwanda, and South Sudan. So if we dial back the clock just a few years with the West African outbreak in 2014, 2016, this was caused by the Zaire form of the Ebola virus, again, a viral hemorrhage of fever, leading to over 30, nearly 30,000 cases and over 11,300 deaths. But many of these were healthcare workers, again, over nearly 500 deaths in healthcare workers. So these were our brothers and sister actually, sisters actually in the trenches fighting Ebola. This is one of these uh, such uh, individuals, uh, Dr. Sheikh Kumar Khan, uh, was a national hero, was actually the chief physician of the Kenema Government Hospital Lhasa Fever Program. And his brother had a poignant uh, but, but uh, important quote, a sincere prayer is that his death would not be in vain. What are the lessons learned from West, West Africa that would translate to uh, future generations as we think about these diseases and identities and come to a vaccine and a cure? Um, just a bit, a little bit about the, the fragile health systems where Ebola is found. In the highest transmission countries of DR Congo, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, these countries actually lag far behind the world with these health indices. As you can see with infant mortality, under five, under five mortality in Sierra Leone, about one in seven to one in eight children under the age of five won't, actually won't live to the age of five. Life expectancy, again, lagging far behind the United States and the world. Other human developed indices, including health, education, and standard of living as a composite index, again, leave room and opportunities for uh, improvement. But Ebola really became a global concern for us uh, in Atlanta and also globally <clears throat> when United States healthcare workers were repatriated from Liberia, including Dr. Kent Brantley and Ms. Nancy Reichel, to Emory as patients one and two. But our, the patient that's really essential in the story was Dr. Ian Crozier. He was a critically ill healthcare worker. He was hospitalized for 40 days and 40 nights. He developed acute renal failure, <clears throat> requiring dialysis for three weeks, and also lung failure, requiring intubation and medical, mechanical ventilation for nearly two weeks. But he emerged as a survivor, uh, again, from critical life-threatening illness. And, and three months after his acute infection, he presented to our Emory UBI service with an aggressive, vision-threatening eye inflammation. We first presented this in, in ARVA in 2015, uh, but his disease actually progressed in a very rapid <clears throat> time period, from, from actually a two-week time period, first as a hypertensive anterior uveitis, developing to a painful scleritis, a hypopian iris heterochromia changing from blue to green, and a severe pan uveitis actually with hypotony. And we were concerned about the possibility that could rapidly be going into tysis, and I called on many of our colleagues for, uh, for assistance uh, to help treat his disease process. Unfortunately, he improved later on. But during this context, we identified that his aqueous humor was positive for Ebola virus RNA with RT-PCR. You can see that fully 100 days after his acute infection, the Ebola virus RNA in his aqueous fluid was positive, where he actually had cleared his RNA from his blood, and it was soon found to be Ebola virus culture positive by the CDC Viral Special Pathogens Branch, with whom we collaborated. And this was reported, but really this told the story not only of the individual patient, but how this would translate to the other thousands of survivors in West Africa. As I recall, there are, there are many, many patients who were affected with this condition. So at the time, Dr. Shanta and I and many others were concerned about the possibility that there could be blinding illness in other individuals. You can see Dr. Crozier picture here with individuals that get taken care of in Kenma, the eastern part of Sierra Leone. Again, just thinking about number 17,000 survivors in West Africa, over 1,000 <coughs> survivors in the Air Congo. He's one of 18,000 individuals. And so, at the invitation of Dr. John Thankhauser, who was the lead clinician who had actually played a leading role in evacuating, again, the, the clinicians from ELWA Hospital, Dr. Thankhauser was soon recognized that the patients were developing ciliary body flush, uh, some pain and light sensitivity, and actually called myself, uh, Dr. Shanta, and 
Dr. Plastic Surgeon Dr. Brent Hyatt, to come to start evaluating patients in Liberia to try to figure out whether this was indeed a problem in, in West Africa. So we set up a small clinic in ELWA Hospital, very limited in terms of resources, and we soon found that there was indeed a problem, and we were later reported on this. Of nearly 100 Ebola survivors were screened. Uh, UVX was seen in over 20% of individuals, again, in this early small cohort, with a number of bilateral cases. We also found the vision impairment was significant. This was seen in over 60% of eyes. In 40% of eyes, nearly 40% of eyes, these individuals actually met the World Health Organization definition of blindness 2400 or worse. Soon after, we've, we've also collaborated with colleagues from the NIH, and this is from the Prevail 3 study group led by Rachel Bishop and Alan McGarry. They've looked at additional survivors who looked at the problem, and what they found is in their large cohort of nearly 1,000 Ebola survivors, 26% of these individuals have developed uveitis at their enrollment. Interestingly, 12% of controls also have uveitis. These are close contacts. This number actually increases over time, but one in three individuals who have survived Ebola will have uveitis. Again, a growing public health issue that we're starting to uncover. Now the question is, why do these patients lose vision and go blind? So we've seen patients with neovascular glaucoma. This patient has translumination defects with these, uh, these iris vessels actually tra traversing these areas of stromal atrophy. You get cataract and hypotony, and unfortunately some patients with tysis because of the limitation of access. Next we went to Sierra Leone. So again, look at the spectrum of UVI that's partnered with uh, WHO as well as Partners in Health. And we similarly found a high rate of UVIs, nearly 20%. Eight, 18 of these patients in the series of 50 patients identified to have UVIs actually had bilateral disease. A significant minority had anterior UVIs, 46%. And you can see a number of these patients, patients also have intermediate, posterior, and hand UVIs. This was reported in Lights of IV. So we're starting to see some concerning parallels from the Ebola outbreak. Again, going back to what we think about in terms of the health system. When we look at the case fatality rate from Ebola in West Africa, it, it actually approximates 75%, so three in four individuals will pass away from Ebola. In the United States and Europe, devastating disease, still 20% is very high, but not to a level. The level of vision impairment or blindness in patients with UVI is 60% vision impairment, 40% blind. Again, limited numbers in the United States, but we haven't had any cases of vision loss as of yet. So since then, our mission has been thinking about ways to start to close this gap, and it seems like a monumental task, I think, at times, but I think as we, as a global health community, really continue to think about and are charged to do. So first, really think about how do we impact vision health disparities in Africa using evidence to guide UVI and retinal care. Secondly, to develop clinical and research capacity through educational programs for eye care providers, uh, individuals that we continue to work with in partnership to train to equip the next generation of West Africa and African leadership in ophthalmology. And lastly, we're looking to build a research program to understand emerging infectious diseases in Sierra Leone and partner countries, and I'll dive in a little bit to some of the ways that we've tried to think about closing this gap. So the first issue that we confronted was how do we address cataract blindness in Ebola survivors? So Dr. Shantha and I, Dr. Williams, and many, many partners started looking at, looking at ways to, to guide surgery based on evidence. We, we set up the Ebola virus persistence in ocular tissues and fluids study in Sierra Leone, this is the EVIX study, again to determine the prevalence of Ebola virus in eyes of survivors who need cataract surgery to guide safe and vision restorative surgery for, for survivors based on evidence. And this was a complex study design because first we had to think about the pre-procedure evaluation to, to uh, confirm e Ebola virus in survivorship, do appropriate laboratory testing. You can see Dr. Ian Crozier traveled back with us to provide work uh, with related to consent and counseling. So one of the difficult tasks was thinking about how do we perform an ophthalmic procedure in an infection control potential of BSL-4 exposure status. And so we worked with the WHO as well as public health and infectious disease specialists to design this facility. In this facility, you can see that there's this green area where we don we put on our personal protective equipment, we enter a red zone where we perform the procedure. Um, again, with infectious disease specialists monitoring, so Colleen Kraft traveled with us, performed the study, and subsequently exiting through a transition zone to assure that we had appropriately sterilized our personal protective equipment. You can see um, Dr. Shanta and myself in this room performing a procedure um, on an individual, a really poignant picture uh, with individuals who were assisted. We enrolled 50 patients, the median age was quite young, 24 years. The median log age for acuity was, was hand motion, so a lot more 3.0, so hand motion level of vision. The diagnosis predominantly included visually significant cataract, but we also enrolled individuals who likely would need 
A retinal surgery included sublux lens, uh, two patients with active UDS, and one patient with a blind painful lot. Now, the, the, the time frame for when patients actually were evaluated was anywhere from one, eight, one and a half years to three years out after their acute infection, so far longer than um, Dr. Crozier's case. But what we found is that the 50 patients that we assessed, 49 acres humor and one venture sample actually tested negative for Ebola virus by RT-PCR. We also looked at pre-procedure and post-procedure chondrocarbon specimens, which actually tested negative uh, for Ebola virus in the 22 patients who were assessed in the first days of the study. And so this provide, provided more reassurance, although we still use proper infection control precautions, as our, uh, our Ethiopian cataract surgeon, who was installed by the Christian Blind Mission, actually performed these surgeries, and the outcomes were quite good, moving from hand motions to level vision at baseline to 2030 vision at four month follow up in the individuals who, who returned for surgery. And what was interesting is that we actually performed these, uh, these procedures in West Africa, and this actually informed our decision making when our patient, Dr. Ian Crozier, developed a cataract. He developed a hand motions cataract, and so we had to use similar personal pr protective equipment and uh, precautions as well as infectious disease monitoring. And when Dr. Joe Wells performed his surgery, his surgery, again, seeing him go from hand motions to 2020 vision. Now, what does this mean when we think about Ebola virus persistence and how does this apply to other immune privileged organs? Well, it turns out that we know that Ebola virus can persist in other organs, including reproductive organs. Uh, its persistence in seminal fluid has been linked to sexual transmission with genomic material. Uh, being identified in both cases, but an individual who had Ebola and also the, the person who actually acquired Ebola through sexual transmission. Central, central nervous system involvement, which can lead to meningitis or meningoencephalitis in a Scottish nurse uh, who developed Ebola uh, while she was caring for individuals, individuals during the outbreak. It can also persist in the placenta, which can lead to still more infants, and we've seen unfortunate cases of maternal death uh, in this context. But there's been quite a bit of basic sciences literature and individuals and partners that we've worked with to study these very questions of where does Ebola virus persist and how does this mediate inflammation? Why is the, the rate of UVI so high? This is from one of our collaborators from the Department of Defense from U.S. Amory. And they looked at a cohort of non-human primate Ebola survivor monkeys who had received medical countermeasures who were, after they were infected Ebola. What they found was that genomic Ebola virus, virus RNA was actually detected in the, the vitreous by these sophisticated in situ hybridiz hybridization techniques targeting Ebola virus genomic nu nucleoprotein probes. You can see here, as highlighted by the red, that the Ebola virus seemed to live, seems to live just at the interface between the vitreous and the retina. They also identified that the CD8 that, that the Ebola virus seemed to live in CD868, CD68 positive macrophages and monophages, monocytes, potentially as a reservoir uh, harboring Ebola. But Dr. Justine Smith has done some really leading work in, in, in vitro looking at Ebola virus and has shown that Ebola virus can't, human RP cells are permissive to infection by Ebola virus, and that these RP cells actually supported viral replication and release of virus in high tide. She's also learned and taught us about the immunology of what happens and how this relates to human privilege. So it turns out using very sophisticated RNA studies, she's shown a robust type 1 interferon response, which is really thought to be antiviral in nature. Uh, but these cells can also maintain an immunomodulatory profile, which allows the Ebola virus potentially to persist locally. When it proceeds to lytic infection, then that's when it becomes uh, destructive. And so these virus RP interactions may contribute to long-term persistence of Ebola virus, and still the story's uh, left to be untold, and we're still working on the story as well. One of our collaborators at the Emory Vaccine Center has looked at the longitudinal analysis of B-cell response to Ebola virus infection, namely, how, do, how, does, how does the immune system response to the potential for Ebola virus persistence? So they did a longitudinal study of B cell responses to Ebola for survivors who were actually repatriated during the West African outbreak. And what they had found, what they found was that individuals who were infected developed these long-lasting Ebola-specific immunoglobulin antibodies. And this was seen in all four survivors. You can see that the IgG1 continues to persist. The IgG3 levels go down, and the IgG4 level, the interesting class switching, actually goes up over time. And they further actually used these neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that target Ebola virus glycoprotein against Ebola virus in animals, which actually demonstrated protection for Ebola virus infection. So they're rapidly moving from what they're learning from West Africa to potentially other, other uh, therapeutics for vaccine immunity. We're currently looking at the clinical disease uh, with, on with ongoing studies that will happen over the next five years. Also looking at molecular diagnostics to evaluate vitreous fluid for Ebola virus persistence as well as working with the Emory Vaccine Center 
to look at T and B cell responses that are specific for Ebola virus antigen in survivors with uveitis. <clears throat> Furthermore, we've worked with our pediatric uh, ophthalmologist, Dr. Natalie Weil, and others, looking at really a cohort of patients that's been largely, unfortunately, ignored during these, these outbreaks, these, these children. We're continuing to look at the prevalence of uveitis in pediatric Ebola survivors as well as close contacts, as well as the impact of Ebola virus disease, uveitis, and mental health disability. This is our preliminary data. We actually looked at 86 Ebola-affected pediatric patients. So we use the term Ebola-affected. These are individuals that include both survivors as well as close contacts. Unfortunately, some of these children have lost uh, parents or loved ones to Ebola. And really looking at whether there's a difference between Ebola, Ebola survivors as well as these close contacts. The median age was 10 years. What was interesting is that the pediatric age populations, we seem to see a lower rate of UVIs. Again, the smaller numbers, 3% developed UVIs. But what we also found is that a, at a moderate to high percentage of these individuals in the locations where we worked also showed vernal keratic conjunctivitis. So we're also starting to see other diseases that we think are immunologically related um, in this cohort. You can see this one patient with a Horner Trantis dots with an incognito injection um, that we saw in this study. This is a two-year-old patient, uh, interestingly, unfortunately had measles uh, during infancy with corneal scarring from measles. He developed Ebola virus at a very young age. Uh, during survivorship, about three to four months after his Ebola virus infection, you can see the sequelae of uh, UBIs, including pigment changes, posterior sneak eye, and cataract as well. So again, informing us about the the individual and public health impact of this disease. So what are some of the challenges and approaches to outbreak response for eye disease? What do we do when something like this starts to, starts to occur? Because we knew that in West Africa, we were starting to hear rumors that there were individuals having eye disease. So it was hard to know how to respond. Some of the challenges include resource limitations in regions where the outbreaks occur. Uh, there's a paucity uh, in some countries of infrastructure, equipment, and the need for additional training. Uh, but some of these approaches include improved infrastructural support and training in centers where outbreaks are likely to occur, perhaps considering photography by non-ophthalmologist personnel on a telemedicine basis, which many of, many of us have attended lectures for at this AAO. There's also the consideration of rapid response teams to deploy in coordination with the World Health Organization, CDC, and public health personnel, as well as other studies that are more rigorous and robust, including the prospective controlled natural history studies as in the NIH-funded prevail three study of Ebola survivors, but certainly these can be hard to get off the ground in an acute, acute, acute uh, outbreak setting where there's an emergency. <clears throat> so we've approached this in several different ways. Um, with, the, with the outbreak of the DR Congo, we were invited by the World Health Organization, the Global Outbreak Alert Response Network, to really launch a program to start working with local healthcare providers to, to talk about UVIs, to start a conversation about how do we treat this uh, pathology, what are we looking for, and so Dr. Shanta, myself, Dr. Jean-Claude Mwanza from the University of North Carolina traveled to DR Congo to start to, again, start this conversation. During this time, we were able to provide care uh, for nearly 300 survivors, but really the impact were the 10 DRC ophthalmologists were able to come and attend the training and also examine patients alongside us. Again, thinking forward, how do we discuss opportunities for eye care and vision health strengthening for DR Congo? These are some of the images you see Dr. Shanta working with a local healthcare provider as well as seeing a patient, Dr. Ian Crozier, you can see he's back in action, uh, helping us with some of this photography and other individuals who are involved with indirect ophthalmoscopy, V-scan, ultrasonography, and really um, elevating our, our tools that we need to use to take care of complex disease. Efficient clinic setup is certainly something that we all consider and think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but when we're screening a large number of patients, we make sure that we, we think about uh, complex examinations, including for uveitis and for retinal disease. We had to set up new systems, including how do we think about uh, patient movement? How do we design a facility so it actually works uh, for patients to move through important aspects of history taking, ocular vitals, visual fields, pupils, slip of examination, and the like, to ensure an accurate examination, good care, and also thorough counseling for their disease condition. These, again, are some of the images that you see. Looking at the various stations, given that, as we know, ophthalmology can be a very modular, uh, modular field for us to be able to teach individuals at these stations for the different components of the eye exam. Looking forward, we're working with many partners to think about a West African Center of Excellence in Vision Care. With regards to learning and education, uh, there's a need for improvements in gender equity and distance learning in West Africa. We've conducted several national educational symposium providers, uh, but we're working in partnership with the Ministry of Health in Sierra Leone as well as individuals from Lola and Ruth Guest High Hospital. 
where, where much of our work has been conducted. Again, thinking about innovative biomedical discovery to really understand these disease conditions and these research initiatives. We have NIH funding to look at Ebola virus as well as other emerging infectious diseases that are on the horizon that are important for us to understand. And also really expanding primary and specialty eye care, including UBI and retinal disease, pediatric eye care, glaucoma, corneal, oculoplastics, neuro ophthalmology, and everything that we need for care in this setting. So beyond Ebola, that again, I mentioned before, there are many diseases that have ophthalmic manifestations. And if you look at these CDC surveillance maps of Africa, you can see that these diseases really are concentrated in different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. It's Ebola, chikungunya, dengue, Rift Valley fever in Eastern Africa that can lead to a retinitis, Zika virus, which we learned about, learned about from our colleagues in South America, and yellow fever, of which there are several outbreaks uh, recently. And as I mentioned previously, there are a number of ophthalmic manifestations that we need to continue to understand um, and learn about, including Lhasa, Crimea Congo, and other diseases which remain undiscovered. Um, at this point. So what is the role of the UBI specialist, the retina specialist, and the IMD? And I think that there are really several roles. One is that we need to continue to understand the expanding spectrum of these conditions, the UBI and the retinal manifestations, the anterior segment manifestations of emerging infectious disease. We need to continue to define the role of persistent pathogen, these mechanisms of disease, basic and translational mechanisms, and the broad-ranging implications for infection, autoimmunity, and how this translates to public health and therapeutics. And lastly, what we've been really invested in is really how do we think about engaging in our field globally, and really our global interconnectedness uh, with this international audience that we have here uh, truly mandates improved education and UBI's research uh, for both with the United States, our international partners, and globally for the health of our patients for these emerging infectious disease. I'll just leave you with a quote, and I'll show you a short video in just a second, but uh, Bill Fahey uh, really spearheaded the elimination of smallpox, and he really refers to the faces behind the numbers, the individuals, the patients that we care for, and the numbers, the larger numbers that we see in studies. And I think this is a really important to, uh, um, phrase um, that I think about in terms of how do we think about the evidence and how does this translate to individual patient care. And so Rob Ryman, uh, who's one of my mentors at every Global Health Institute, is one of Dr. Shanta's mentors, who has a quote, and he says, if we can see and relate to the individual stories of families, whose lives have been dramatically affected, will feel our interest in solving the bigger problems that lie behind the outbreak. And so you can see some of the images here. You can see Dr. Crozier with Augustine Bandy, who was actually a patient from our EVIC study. He actually is one of our one of the survivors that's working with us doing ophthalmic imaging now. Uh, Dr. Jessica Shanta with Umaru Uri, who's a, sorry, Umaru Sise, um, who's, a, who's a young man. He's growing, we continue to work with him. Three beautiful African children who we've uh, uh, taking care of and continue to watch them grow up. And uh, there's one that really poignant moment when Dr. Shanta and I were actually at a, at a home for some of these children, uh, where they actually surprised us with a song. The song was, We Are Leaders of Tomorrow. A little difficult to hear, but I'd just like to cue this up um, as we sort of think about the individuals that we affect.